Isolation and individualism, we are reminded of how important it is to stay connected to God and to each other. Jesus gave us a meaningful metaphor to help make the point. I am the vine and you are the branches, Jesus declared. Jesus calls us into a life of connection before production, a life rooted in genuine love, a life that yields fruit that lasts as we abide in him. Well, thank you for being here today. Let me extend my welcome to you as well as those online. We are blessed to be together today to celebrate God and connect with Him and to rejoice and just live for Him in our daily lives. Connection is important. Uh, let me tell you a bad connection. Whenever I was a kid in the mid-60s, my brother had an 8-track tape player that he gave to me and I thought, why put batteries in this thing when you could just plug it in to the wall? So, you know, I'm kind of techie now, but I, I was not so techie then. So I uh, soldered two wires on it to plug it into the wall where the batteries go. And I plugged it in and just poof, just a big smoke pile. And I thought that didn't work so well, <laughs> but uh, I learned better from that in time in uh, in 1979, I went to Harding and I decided I was going to record my classes. So I took a volume control and made it to a, on a plug so I could plug it into the side of this uh, cassette tape recorder so that I could record and do it at a different speed and get more recordings on less tape. And it worked great. It, uh, so I, I learned something as I went along. But, but connections are important. Bad connections are bad news. So you want to make the right connections whenever you go through life. We're in this series of Connected. In fact, we're wrapping it up today. It's been a great series. I've really enjoyed it. I think it was really important as the video description there reminded us it's not about production. You can't have production without connection. Connection is really important. So connection to God is primary. Other lessons were the danger of disconnection. Sometimes we get connected to God and we drift and things come in between God and us. Uh, then the source of life, which was Jesus, the purpose of pruning, that was that lesson on discipline. God prunes us and we need to prune some things in our lives to be the production, to have the production we need. Uh, then grafted and growing, where, where we're grafted into the vine and... Uh, being able to grow and get our nourishment from that. The greater love, love is important and love comes up in our lesson today. And then there was that community, our connected community. And that's when we did our sign ups for ministry. Appreciate a lot of you signing up. We're gonna talk about hospitality today. Some of you signed up in that area. Thank you so much. But we get connected and we become fruitful and, and be able to produce that way. And that was the next lesson, fruit that lasts. The Spirit lives within us and works to produce fruit that um, is a blessing to others, especially others in the body, but it's a, a fruit that also reaches out to those around us. And today we come to the culture of connection. Culture has its interesting connotations. Sometimes we're afraid of culture, uh, but we create culture. And we, and we can create culture, and we should create culture and a, and a good culture. Uh, there's a story told about a woman in Ireland that whenever they started developing electricity and getting it in neighborhoods to the average person, and she was uh, a pretty uh, wealthy lady, but she was very frugal. I'm sure you've known a few of those. Sometimes you become wealthy by being frugal. But anyway, she did that, and they were noticing early on that for some reason the meter just wasn't reading very much use of electricity so they knocked on our door and talked to her and they said ma'am uh, is everything okay she said I love it it works great and they said but can you explain to us why the meter reading is so low she said well when it gets dark in the evening I turn on the lights well enough to light the candles and then I turn the electricity off well, that's what we do sometimes. You know, God gets us going and we decide we're going to disconnect and, and it costs us a lot. So talking about culture of connection, we think about our mission group that went to McAllen. They'll be there, in, Lord willing, in about an hour. And they'll be settling in and they'll be 
uh, worshiping and all of that. But they do a lot of good things, a lot of good deeds, which produces a lot of goodwill and opportunity to preach the good news. And then they can uh, do that. But the real basic thing they learn, you and I learn when we're young like that, and that's why we're missing a lot of high school and college today. Uh, one of the things you learn is how to connect. And you learn to connect through showing, seeing other people's examples. Think about Jesus' ministry when he went and taught his disciples. He chose those 12 to, to minister to, to minister with, and to teach and disciple. So he eventually sends them out and he tells them, okay, I want you to go to a community, connect with somebody, stay with them, and, and don't move around until you get ready to leave town. But they developed connections. They learned how to make connections. My dad was a Coke truck driver, as a salesman of Coke. I learned kind of his sales principles. My mother was a hairdresser, and I learned how to talk to people. And we learned how to connect. And hopefully, prayerfully, and by design, we learn how to connect to people in the Lord's church. Because people come here. That's how Christ's message gets spread. Sometimes we go. Sometimes we invite. And when we invite, we want people to be received. We want them to connect. We don't want them to leave thinking, wow, I did not connect with anybody. So it takes our effort like God did. He took the first step to save us. And we respond to that love. When it comes to our relationship representing Jesus, we share love and then they know the love of God. They'll know we're his disciples by our love for one another. So, so important. And so we create culture. Culture is what you experience when you go somewhere. We've all been there, haven't we? Some stores you go into, some businesses, some uh, opportunities, you know the culture they don't have to tell you what their culture is. You know what it is. So let me give you a couple of, kind of look at a couple of words. We're going to look at connection, culture, and I want to talk about hospitality. So throw out a couple of those and give you, a, first of all, a quote by Tim Keller, Timothy Keller. He, the Lord's Supper connects things. It connects the present to the past. It connects your soul to God. It connects the individual to community. And it connects your life story to the future. So whenever we take the Lord's Supper, we do proclaim the Lord's kingdom. And we talk about connections. Well, connections are uh, just those relationships we have that we build with other people or other things. Most of all, God. Our connection to God allows us to create all the good in our life. My connection to God brings out the best in me. It brings out the best in you. Culture is, uh, we, we talk about culture sometimes, about the old culture, or you go to a different uh, community or uh, country, and there's a different culture there. And we try to, in America, strategize. And, and Peter Drucker says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's a lot like, you know, I'm a fill-in preacher today, okay? If you're a guest today, this is not usually what you're going to get. You'll get better. But I will say one thing that communicates across all lines is a smile and a wave, a handshake, or experiencing love within a community. Most people go away from church saying, those are friendly people, or those are not friendly people. They don't talk about the sermon very often. They talk about the people. And that's the culture we want them to walk away with. And hospitality is our way. Uh, here in the South, we talk about Southern hospitality. We, it's our way of making people feel at home. Uh, and those who practice hospitality certainly entertain God himself. So th think about that. The church is, a is not a sanctuary for saints. It's a it's a a place for hurting sinners to come and to build and to support and lean on one another. Let me tell you a story about the downside of all of this or how outsiders see it sometimes. Years ago, and in first service, I said about 15 or 20 years ago, my wife reminded me it's been longer than that. It's been like 35 years ago. 
read this book, great book, Dying for Change by Leif Anderson. I, I couldn't find it, so I don't know where it is anymore, but I'm sure, uh, I'm sure I loaned it out to somebody. But anyway, what I walked away with from the book is it's important for the church to be hospitable. A lot of great lessons in there, and it, uh, the, the congregation he's with, a, a large church, thousands of people, and that day, we went that evening, uh, we drove up to Minneapolis and went to church there, and we took our kids with us. That's what made me realize it was a long time ago, because they were pretty small. They were early elementary age, and we went in, and Bill Bright, Dr. Bill Bright, who's world-renowned for mission work and all that, spoke. The message was wonderful. The personal experience from an outsider who came in, nobody spoke to us. We really didn't know real well where to go. And we just assumed we were going to be overwhelmed with this culture of hospitality and embracing. And so we sat near the back, almost like where the break would be back there. We sat a little bit further back, but we were sitting behind a person in front of us. And the husband played with his wife's earrings during the whole lesson. That was kind of distracting. But anyway... Uh, our boys, you know, they're boys. They were, I mean, to sit through an hour-long sermon was kind of hard, but they, they were really well-behaved that time, so it wasn't too bad. But after the lesson, he turned around and let us have it for not taking our children to some other place that they had designated. Nobody told us that, and we apologized for our children not behaving real well, but... What culture did we walk away with? So it's important that we connect with people. I don't know if you connect, uh, see people like this. Maybe you are this person. No, I, we saw this person in, in Sam's last week wearing this T-shirt that you can see. It says, I'm trying very hard not to connect with people right now. I know you. we've all felt that, okay? But when you wear that shirt behind the counter of, of uh, customer service, that's not a good thing, okay? <laughs> but we've all felt that. Don't, feel, don't put off that vibe for people who come and visit us. We want to put off the vibe, the feeling, the culture of love and embracing and, and allowing people to come. According to a study in 2006, our circle of close friends is getting smaller. And since then, we know it's even smaller. But during those 20 years prior, the number of people we uh, can discuss that are in our lives that matter most important to us dropped nearly a third from 2.94 to 2.08. What that tells me is culture is fragmenting, withdrawing, individualizing, and asking your neighbor for a cup of sugar is not the thing to do anymore. You might get a dress with a gun at the door, but probably they're not even going to open the door. But our circle of friends is getting smaller, and, and I would say that's probably under two now if they were to do that same study. But what helps... Uh, friends grow, that number grow is proximity, repeated connections, and, and a setting that encourages people to let their guard down and confide in each other. We develop those kind of friendships at church, don't we? So to connect with people, if we want them to come back, we need to invite them, we need to pray about it, we need to uh, probably greet them again the next week, sit next to them or close to them, and have those repeated connections and uh, get to know them. So that's really important. Now the scriptures teach us about hospitality. There's a lot of scriptures we can look at, but I want to spend time in just about three sections of scripture. The first one is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. We're going to just uh, comment as we go through this and reflect on it and think about it and how we can become better uh, in growing in this area. Edmond is a lovely church. We have a lot of love. We have a lot of love for ourselves and our friends that are here. We can uh, do better in expanding that as well as those that are around us. 
The verse starts out saying the end is near. The end of all things is near. <clears throat> Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. I would say you should be alert and sober-minded when you pray. Also, be alert of those people that are around you. Be alert so you can reach out to them, pray for them. If you see somebody maybe who's very emotional, you might want to uh, connect with them. Maybe it's just a pat on the back. Maybe it's, it's a look uh, that says you care. But there are people, frequently, people who decide they're going to come to church, they've had a bad day or a bad week or a bad year, and they're looking for hope. And there are people around them that could connect and help them and inspire them. And we all need that. So be alert of those who are around you. But verse 8 says, above all. That means it's a real high priority. Jesus, when asked about what the most important commandment is, he talked about loving God. And then he said, loving our neighbors as ourselves. So above all, love one another deeply. Uh, beyond Southern hospitality, care for them. Weep with those that weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice. So love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Our church, we're full of sinners. Uh, we, our lives are full of sin and we're getting better. God's re, uh, transforming our lives. So we're doing better. But love is what helps us get through things. Sometimes we need somebody to love us when we don't feel very lovable. Well, when we're not very lovable and we don't feel very loved. But we should uh, love each other deeply and cover those sins because love does that. Husbands and wives overlook those things. We overlook our kids' imperfections. We sometimes magnify other parents, their kids' issues. But love covers all of that. And the more we grow in love, we overlook a lot of things. And that's really good. Then offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. That means if somebody sits in your pew, mm, yeah, offer hospitality. And don't grumble. Don't, don't say, that's my seat. Uh, there's not a name on the bottom of all these pews, I don't think. so. Uh, I've, I've been with churches before that that people were very particular. I don't notice that here because we've got other seats you can move to, I guess. That's, that's a good thing. But offer hospitality. Embrace people. In fact, encourage them to come and sit with you. That, that even speaks volumes there. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. That's that lesson two or three weeks ago on uh, a community of connection involved in ministries that serve and help others. So serve others as faithful servants and stewards of God's grace in various forms. And then in verse 11, it says, If anyone speaks, they should do so uh, as one who speaks the very words of God. Sometimes if you don't know what to say, just, just speak Scripture. That's, very, that's always helpful. Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes when people lose a loved one, sometimes the best thing you can do is read a familiar Scripture. Your words may not comfort near as much as Scripture does. Uh, depends on the situation. But if anyone does serve, they should do so with the strength God provides. It's not always comfortable. A lot of us would probably wear that shirt about being connected, uh, disconnected, not wanting to connect. It's not always easy to go up and talk to somebody else, but God will give you the strength. Just take a step, open your mouth, and it will come out. By the way, I'm, I'm talking about a lot of these things as in church assembly. But a lot of these things can be practiced wherever you are. In the waiting office at the doctor or the dentist or hairdresser or whatever it may be. Those are always opportunities to share words of encouragement. But God will give you the strength. And then God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That's, that's who gets the praise. Well, to sum up this to a large extent, let me just say hospitality is God working through his disciples to make connections cultural. That should be our nature. We are a greenhouse for growth. We, we are an opportunity. We provide an environment or a culture, 
a mindset where people can come and grow. They may not be to your level of maturity, but you can help them take the next step. And that's what we want to do. You know, when people come to, to the Edmund Church, they, they come to our parking lot, they come through the doors, uh, they come into the hallway, they come and sit down here in a Bible class, and those are all very fearful things. So you can come alongside them and embrace them and help them find a place, and that making them feel at home is so, so important. We have bulletin greeters, we have people who greet in the hallways, we have our shepherds greet a lot. We have uh, people who greet outside the doors and inside the doors and pass out bulletins and all of that. The other thing we do really well, I love this about Edmund, is you think about it when you're born in this congregation, uh, we celebrate babies. And we welcome babies. We welcome those who cry little inside note, when I was the third child of three boys, I cried and my parents quit going to church. So uh, don't quit going. We love babies. But we welcome our babies, and then they are in children's ministry. And our children's ministry do a great job, a fantastic job, of passing them on to the youth group. And the youth, but there's a graduation and all the stuff that goes with that. It's, it's awesome. The youth group then... Uh, they are embraced. Some stay here. Some go to other churches that, are in, that embrace them. But our youth uh, college ministry embraces them. And then they go into our young adults ministry and, and in our regular adult classes. Our adult classes are designed to, to connect with people. That's so great. A lot of other areas, areas of ministry. And then we have shared experiences on Sunday night that are great to incorporate people who maybe are just starting out spiritually, come and share a meal, uh, play dominoes, whatever it is, play basketball, whatever it is. But we, are, uh, we do really well at that, but we can even do better. Well, the downside of that, I'll just, let's take a little field trip mentally, okay? I'm gonna, we're going to look at James 2. I, don't, I, I just put the reference up there on the, the PowerPoint. But let me just read it. Maybe you want to close your eyes. Maybe you'll reflect at a time you went to some place and this is the way you felt. James says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over another, over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discriminate, uh, discrimination show that your judgment are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't, the rich, isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? You... Uh, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. We've all been in one of those churches where they, you know, they, they embrace certain ones, but they kind of shun others. We need to embrace everybody, love everyone. Jesus loves everybody, and we should as well. Well, that's the negative example. I don't want to spend any, any more time on that, but just to motivate you and encourage you that the, church, the Christ church is made up of people who have been sinners but they have been called to a connection, a culture of connection. He's called us to represent him, to embrace people, and to welcome people to, to come in. Jesus talks about Gentiles. He said, you know, if you do good to those who do good to you, you're just like the Gentiles. 
That's, that's all of us. Do good to those who do good to you. But Jesus calls us to something greater. He said, do good to all people. And he also encourages us to take the first step to be good to people. We are more than Gentiles. We are people who have the spirit of Christ within us to reach out to others. Herman Mel Melville says, uh, we cannot live only for ourselves. A thousand fibers connect us with our fellow men. So that's a responsibility we have and a nature that we have. Well, in winding down, I want to encourage you to live out Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. He says, keep on loving. That's, that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, keep on, uh, keep on the, uh, to do it continually. Uh, don't just do it once and quit. But keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospi hospitality to strangers. By the way, we were all strangers at one time. So when strangers come in, don't forget to show hospitality. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angel, angels without knowing it. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever been nice to somebody and then they disappear? And, or they were nice to you and they disappear. Well, you're doing God's work when you, you offer hospitality. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So think about you. As, as Jesus said, we want to do good to others as we would have others do to us. If you were a stranger and you came to this church and you didn't know anybody, you didn't know anything about anybody here, and you didn't know where to go, what would you be looking for? You'd look for somebody who hopefully is not wearing a shirt saying I'm trying to disconnect, but you would look for somebody whose eyes would lighten up, they would have a smile on their face, and they would have a welcoming posture to come, and as you come to them, to help them. That's what Jesus is looking for in us to do that. So let me, let me uh, help visualize this for you. We are doing this well, yet we can make Christ connections more natural. And after I said that, I thought, hmm, more spiritual too. So I didn't change the slide, but I will tell you to be more like the Spirit of Christ being in you. So make eye contact with people, smile. From the moment you come in the parking lot, you're probably going to see somebody you don't know. But if you do know them, certainly you're going to smile and greet them as a brother and sister in Christ. But parking lot, as you come through those doors, or as you see people come in those doors... Hey, if somebody from first service came to second service, you wouldn't know maybe whether they were a brother or sister or not. So they might be. Embrace them. On your way through the halls, as you check in children in the, the place back there, or on your way to find a pew, or as we're dismissed, maybe we'll get out of here a few minutes early today. It'll be time you can use to connect with somebody else before leaving today. Connect with other people. Uh, on your way to class, on your way out the doors. But uh, many of you greet guests, and I appreciate that. Not too long ago, and, th and this happens all the time, but just a few weeks ago, somebody I didn't really expect to be so uh, warm and fuzzy actually saw somebody kind of emotional after we were dismissed. And he went over and talked to them, and then he said, I want to bring you out. Whoops, sorry about that. Go out to the welcome table, and... Uh, Find somebody who will be able to speak with you, give you a gift, and all of that. So that is awesome whenever that happens. One of the rules we had, and I'm not a rules person necessarily, but one of the rules we had when we planted churches in Wisconsin and Minnesota was we had a two-minute rule. So for two minutes after church, you don't talk to anybody you know. You talk to somebody you don't know. Now that does a number of things. It keeps somebody from dominating them, and, and it helps them get to know more people. But two minutes is a small investment. You can get by with really shallow conversation in that time. But they will feel like if a number of people do that, that's a loving church. I want to go back there again and get to know those people better. So 
uh, we don't necessarily have that rule here, but that is a calling, I think. So that is the stronger, intentional kind of a focus. And then do it, do it quickly. Don't say, uh, oh, I'm going to talk to five of my friends, and then I'll go talk to those people. Well, by that time, those people are in their car, and they are already at a restaurant, and they were, they're talking about, that wasn't a very friendly church, was it? So do it, do it quickly, do it immediately, and apply it. And the last thing I want to mention is that God gave humans the capacity. Well, this is a quote by Bruce Riley Ashford. Ashford. God gave humans the capacity to create culture and then commanded them to use those capacities. God has given us that ability. We need to create a culture, improve that culture, spread that culture at church, in our neighborhoods, at the businesses we work at, the schools we go to, create a culture of embracing other people and sharing the love of Jesus. Well, I really have not talked about putting on Christ, uh, but if you have been thinking about being baptized, putting on Christ, we want to encourage you to do that today. If you need the prayers of this church or you're just kind of down today and you want prayers, we are really willing to uh, pray for you. We do have shepherds that will be going out our doors and in the room right behind me across the hall that uh, pray with people who need prayer. We want to pray for everyone and we want to encourage you to spread the good news and the love of Jesus wherever you go. Thanks for being here. Let's stand and sing and encourage one another.